Welcome to episode 124 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today we get to speak to retired agent Vince McNally, who served in the FBI for more than 31 years. He was initially hired as a support employee, and during his agent career, he conducted and led investigations in general criminal violations, espionage, terrorism, white-collar crime, organized crime, and drug violations. In this episode, Vince McNally reviews the case of a mysterious airplane cargo theft of $1 million worth of negotiable securities stolen from an American Airlines flight traveling between New York and Los Angeles. Later in his career, Vince McNally became an instructor in crisis hostage negotiations and a program manager for the FBI's critical incident stress management teams at the FBI Academy. Vince retired after serving as unit chief of the Employee Assistance Unit at FBI headquarters. Currently, Vince McNally serves on the board of scientific and professional advisors of the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress. He is a compassion fatigue specialist, board certified in acute traumatic stress management, and board certified in emergency crisis response. He is also a certified employee assistant professional. Vince and I continue our conversation from episode 36 about the stress and trauma experienced by first responders that sometimes results in a higher incidence of suicide. Vince shares with us his 10-point program for reducing suicide for first responders. Vince can be contacted via his LinkedIn profile, where he regularly posts articles on critical incidents, trauma, stress, and first responder suicide. Vince shares some alarming statistics about suicide among first responders, including the fact that there are more deaths by suicide in law enforcement than there are line of duty deaths. Isn't that shocking? So I hope you stick around for the second half of the interview when Vince talks to us about what we can do to reach out to others who are in despair. The case that he reviews is like a mystery to the very end. How did the theft occur? You'll have to listen to find out. But before we get to the interview, I want to give you an update on Greedy Givers. During the initial launch period, Greedy Givers went as high as number nine, on all new releases for financial thrillers. So thank you for those of you who've who've already picked up a copy. I don't do ads on this podcast, but if you want to support me, I hope you'll do so by picking up a copy of any of my books, Greedy Givers, Our Pay to Play, for yourself or for someone you know loves crime fiction. My books are sold exclusively on Amazon.com, Pay to Play, as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook, and Greedy Givers is sold as an ebook and paperback. When I say I don't do ads on this podcast, I guess I have to admit that this is an ad for my crime novels. So again, if you want to support the podcast, if you want to support me, I hope you go out and pick up a copy of Greedy Givers and Pay to Play today. To celebrate the launch of my book, and the birth of my first grandchild, Carter. I am having a It's a Boy, It's a Book giveaway of some very cool FBI swag, including a signed copy of my FBI crime novel, a FBI silhouette target unisex apron, a FBI onesie size 12 months for your future FBI agent, FBI challenge coin, FBI lapel pins, and FBI retired case file review sticker, button, and podcast cards. All the details about this giveaway are in my July reader team email. 
So if you've already signed up to be a member of my reader team, you already have that email. And if you're not yet a member and you want to learn how you could possibly win this prize package of cool FBI swag, then you need to join my reader team by going to my website, jerrywilliams.com and signing up when you see the pop-up. And if I can ask for one more thing, please subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to have back again Vince McNally. Hey, Vince. Hi, Jerry. How are you today? I am good. I talked to you in episode 36, and even though we got together today to talk about a really fascinating and strange case for you, I do want to take a few moments, if you don't mind, to talk about suicide, to continue to talk about this issue This week, we learned of two celebrity suicides, and as a expert in traumatic stress and as a compassionate fatigue specialist, I know that you talk a lot about suicide, especially when it comes to law enforcement, so we are going to do the case review first, and then uh, once we're done with that, then we'll go back to this very important issue. All right, so let's go to the case review, because, you know, when you were telling me about this when we spoke many, many months ago, I thought, I'm going to call you back and do this case review because it's pretty fascinating. Why don't you start us off? Okay. I'll call it the disappearance into thin air of $1.8 million worth of negotiable securities. This is a, uh, this is not representative of every case in the FBI, but I would say it would be a quick study of a criminal case. It covers the violations basically from that from interstate shipment and interstate transportation of stolen property. So it's a little bit of a mystery. And uh, the question is, how did these people do it and who did it and why did they do it? So we're going to cover that. And some of the areas that we're going to cover offers a offers the audience a snapshot of what the FBI does in investigations such as surveillance, handling informants or cooperating witnesses, using undercover agents, buying back stolen items, uh, arresting people, interviewing, eliciting cooperation, testimony in court, grand jury, and trial prep. So it gives you a pretty good snapshot of what an agent does. This is an actual case, and it occurred at uh, John F. Kennedy International Airport, and this was out of the Brooklyn, Queens Metropolitan Resident, Resident Agency, which is part of the New York office. So this happened almost 35 years ago, but it, it stands out to me anyway as just one of those cases that you remember because everything went according to plan almost. First of all, back to JFKRA where this happened. This is a violation of theft from interstate shipment, interstate transportation of stolen property. Well, these are the case, cases that I worked out there. Crime aboard aircraft, destruction of uh, motor vehicle, bomb threats, fugitives, and air piracy, and such. So those are uh, the types of investigations occurring at JFK Airport. Who do we work with? Well, we work with the Port Authority Police, U.S. Customs, Immigration, New York City Police Department, Federal Aviation Administration, and other agencies located out there. As well as on the civilian side, we work with the local airline security, the freight forwarding companies, and those are the two entities that are out there. One of the things that working at an airport involves is basically it's a city within a city, and it has its own culture. And when you're working out there, you it took me a year. I spent about uh, 10 years at JFKRA, and it took me a year to understand how, the intricacies of how to work in such a atmosphere of airline, what the nomenclature was, what was going on, whose responsibility for uh, jobs, you know, what they do, and how it all fits together. So again, it took a year to figure it out, but after a while it became a lot of fun. And the side note is that 
my uncle worked there as a New York City police detective prior to the Port Authority police uh, moving in. So he uh, he actually introduced me to the airport when I was uh, in high school and uh, took me on a tour of the airport when he was the detective out there. And in my previous uh, podcast, I mentioned the fact that he's the one who uh, pretty much put the bug in me to become an FBI agent. So we're at JFKRA and about, uh, let's see, I received a call one morning when I came in. And the call was from the security director of American Airlines at JFK Airport. And he said, hey, uh, we we have a uh, armored car bag missing from the aircraft. And I, I'm listening to him and I said, well, what exactly happened here? Well, he said an armored car came out from Pure Later and it went to the aircraft on plane side, uh, which means it's on the tarmac. And they... Uh, bring the bag to the plane. It's loaded on in the hatch there and in the belly of the aircraft. And the Pure Later Armored Car waits until the door is closed and latched before they even leave the uh, tarmac and go back out of the uh, air- airport area. And the plane took off. It was American Airlines Flight 1 from JFK to Los Angeles. And it had this $1.8 million of negotiable securities in that bag. So as the plane lands in L.A., it was determined that the bag was ripped open and the securities were missing. So as an FBI agent, I'm going, well, then the point of theft, I'm thinking in my mind, must be uh, Los Angeles because it was handled well here. It was uh, observed all the way through being put on the aircraft and the hatch being closed. So I, I couldn't figure that out. But in the, at the first point, I said, okay, what I need to do is we need to talk to all the employees of Pure Later and all the people working the ramp side for American Airlines and anyone else. So I interviewed all these people and I wasn't pretty, I wasn't coming up with anything positive. And we were even going to do uh, uh, polygraph lie detector test on these individuals. So uh, I entered, another thing I did is I entered all these securities, they had numbers on them, into a National Crime Information Center, which is NCIC, which uh, any law enforcement agency can uh, look at or uh, check if they find some securities and see if they're stolen. So we waited, we interviewed, like I said, we interviewed the employee from American Airlines and the Pure Later employees. We did the polygraphs and nothing was coming up. So later, maybe a couple of days later, I received a call from the uh, Brooklyn Queens resident agents, agency saying that they had a hit on NCIC, National Crime Information Center, that one of the securities had ended up in Merrill Lynch in New York City. So I'm saying to myself, How? all right, there's only one. But I said, well, let's go find out what's going on. So I take one of the other agents. We decide to go to the city, and we meet with the manager, and the manager directs us to the security representative who had, uh, who had the uh, security. We looked at the security. He showed it to us, and, and he gave us, the, and we checked the number, and it did match. And I advised him that this was part of the stolen securities from American Airlines. And he he starts telling us, basically, well, I don't know. There's a guy called. I don't have, I really don't know how, know this guy. I don't know much about it. And I, and I advised him, well, maybe you can be the one that we arrest for all these securities. And he looked at me and he said, well, I, I remember pretty much the individual who came in and I have his phone number here. And I said, well, that's great. What I'd like you to do is uh, get in contact with this individual and have him come to your office and see what he, if he has any more securities to have him bring him in. He said, okay. So we set up a meeting, you know, hopefully, that, uh, well, we set up the idea of having a meeting. And it, I think it was a second day later, two days later, 
the representative calls us and said, okay, the individual is going to be coming in and he's going to, uh, he wants to sell some secure, more securities to him. So I said, great. All right. What we'll do is we'll be there when you meet him. When is he coming in? He said, okay, he'll be in at 10 o'clock on such and such a day. I said, great. We'll be there. So myself and another agent again proceeded into Merrill Lynch in New York City. We wait and the individual does come in and we uh, immediately take him into a private room, and we interview him. Now, he tells us, first of all, that he brought bought uh, one of these securities on 125th Street in Harlem from an individual that he doesn't know. And we looked at him, and he said, you got to be kidding. I live in New York City, and that's the best story I've ever heard, but that's not going to cut it. So I told him, okay you're going to uh, take the rap uh, for this because you're you're holding stolen property. And he goes, oh. And he says, okay, I'll I'll help you. And I said, okay, what is the story here? He says, okay, uh, I agree to cooperate. And he tells us of a scenario uh, that these three individuals who are brothers had met him and uh, that uh, they wanted him to, you know, sell these securities. Let me stop you for a minute because I want to sure. make sure I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of how normally securities would be sold. I, I'm pretty sure they're not sold out the street on uh, the street corner like a, you know a drug deal. But Correct. you know what what would be the procedures for selling securities? I mean, who who wants to sell them and who wants to buy them? Well, first of all, they're numbered and they're equal to cash almost. But uh, you'd have to go to a broker to buy them. You can't just buy them on the supermarket as a lottery ticket or something like that. You have to go to a broker to pick, you know, to buy them. And they're stock. You know, they're like stock and they're worth money. But, uh, you, again, you cannot just buy them on the street corner. So, and this guy was telling us that he picked them up, first of all, 125th Street in Harlem is a, a major place where people is like talking about Grand Central Station and buying them there. So uh, we're just going, wait a minute, this guy isn't telling us the right story. He needs to uh, cooperate and get on board here. So he did. So we proceeded along. And we decided that uh, you need to set up, uh, first of all, he told us that he only had this one, but he has the three brothers or four brothers, whoever he said, they they have all of them. They have a, a bunch of them and they want to unload them. And I, we said, okay, here's the scenario we're going to set up. You're going to go back. We're talking to this where he's now, we're calling him a cooperating witness or subject. We're telling him, basically, you go back, tell him that we have a mob associate from Boston who will be flying into LaGuardia Airport, and he's going to pay $100,000 for all the securities. And he is to meet at a hotel adjacent to LaGuardia Airport, which we, which he will provide later on. So this is the scenario that we set up with this individual. And he said, okay. I agree, you know, to tell them, to meet with them, and to see what we can do. So he says, uh, he contacts them, then gets back to me and tells me that, uh, okay, I'm going to meet with these guys and run this story by them on Sunday. And uh, we're going to meet. Uh, he said, I don't know exactly where. They're going to let me know. And I said, all right, let me know so that I can at least watch what you're doing. And he said, okay. That's fine. So finally, I get a call on early Sunday saying, okay, they're going to meet me someplace along the Cross Bronx Expressway. And I go, what? How am I going to follow you there? The bottom line is that I went out there and tried to surveil the uh, individuals. And I was up on a hill overlooking the Cross Bronx Expressway with my binoculars looking down. And all I could see was a big brown van and individuals stepping from the van, talking to my cooperating witness. I couldn't see the license plate. I couldn't see much at all. Did you really believe that he did not know who these three individuals were? Did you believe him? 
No, <laughs> that was I wasn't believing much of what he said. I just wanted him to do to uh, get the rest of the securities, and so we could arrest all the people. So I absolutely correct. I didn't believe everything he said. No, but he was bringing us. You know, not every informant does a hundred percent or provides us a hundred percent of the information. So. This is something I knew. So what we were doing now is we're basically going to, uh, he did his job. He got them out there and they, he met with me after their meeting from the van and he said, okay, they're going to meet, uh, at the hotel and we picked a date and a time and which he had provided them and he, he, they said they would, somebody would show up with the securities and sell it to our undercover agent basically. So what I what I had to do is okay I had the scenario I had the story set up now I needed to get the people involved our agents involved and the U.S. Attorney's Office and coordinate and such so we had the port authorities uh, first of all I contacted the U.S. Attorney and received authorization to arrest if the securities if the securities were brought in so. We I coordinated with the Port Authority police detectives to assist in the arrest and surveillance, and we set up a hotel room at LaGuardia Airport, and we had the videotapes and sound we had an adjoining room, and we had the valence that would be outside and inside uh, the building. So we had uh, Pure Later was very kind to us. They came over and gave us a suitcase full of a hundred thousand dollars for show money, uh, which uh, was very kind to them. And I, if I remember correctly, there was no receipt involved. That was really nice of them <laughs> to trust us. But, yeah, <laughs> we we appreciated that, and I, I was quite surprised that happened. But it worked. That worked out well, anyway. The plan was the the cooperating witness would show up and bring one of the subjects or subjects, uh, one of the accomplices there, whatever, up to our hotel room where I would have one of our agents who uh, would be from the mob, basically. He said he's from the mafia. So he said he was from Boston. And we had a good time, uh, you know, preparing for this. So he was able to... uh, Fit the role very well. So what we did, okay, we're up to showtime now. So here we are out there. We're in position outside. We have the Port Authority police, the FBI, and we're on the, the hotel is on the fringe of LaGuardia Airport. So you have air traffic control, planes flying in and uh, very low and such. So in the staircase, I was walking around trying to get figure out where I was going to be because I had everyone set up. And I happened to look out one of the windows in the staircase, and I recognized the tan van. There it was. And there were the four individuals plus the CW next to the van. And I said, well, this is pretty good. We got everybody, uh, you know, showing up. And I said, this is this is great. So I radioed our units out there, and I said who the targets are and where they're located and to keep an eye on it. So now we have the CW in the room uh, going up to the room with one of the subjects, and they go into the hotel room, and the undercover agent is sitting there, and he shows some of the secure, uh, some of the money, shows the money to them, and they go down and bring up the securities. And our plan was basically is very simple: as soon as we get the securities, if there's anybody else outside, which there were in this case that uh, we would have uh, effect an arrest of these individuals. So that's exactly what happened. The individual came up to the room uh, with the, all the secu- with we learned out later, all the securities, and he was arrested. Now, we have the people outside, the three or four, four people outside, so we have to figure out how to get them. So they're still waiting for the CW and their associate to come back with the money so at that point, we said, we had the CW and the uh, sub, one subject arrested, so we had the rest of them outside. The next point is how do we arrest them? So here we are. We have them surrounded now. Now we're just talking to them. This is one of these stories. We're yelling out, you know, you're under arrest. And, but at that point, 
the uh, DC-10 flies right over our head, so they can't even hear anything we're saying. So these things happen. Oh, that's terrible. I know. So they happened. It didn't mess it up completely because we started over and yelled at them. And after three times, they heard us, and they surrendered without interest, incident. rather. So now we have four individuals plus the CW. We arrest him, obviously, so that... Uh, the others wouldn't figure out who he was in relationship to helping us. And we have John Anderson. He's age 55. We have Palmer Anderson, 46. Uh, Robert Anderson, 41. And a Warren Thomas, age 40. And the CW. So we arrested all of these individuals, transported them to the Brooklyn Queens uh, office, resident uh, agency, and we started uh, fingerprinting, photographing, and processing them. So I looked around, and I said, who should we inter- interview first? And I felt that the uh, this Warren Thomas he was not a brother, of, like the other three were. So I said, I'm, I think I'm going to interview him. Now, at this point, we did not know exactly how they did this. We we have the subjects, but how could they get the money from the aircraft? And uh, exactly how did they do this? Because so far we knew that one of the guys, John Anderson, was an American Airlines baggage handler. And we recovered all the evidence. We had to show money back. We did not have that. We had three brothers plus Thomas plus the CW. So we had, thought we had everybody. The one that worked for American Airlines, did he work for American Airlines in New York or in Los Angeles? He worked at JFK. He was oh, at that's JFK. interesting. Yeah. And I have another question, too. Yeah. When, the, when the plane arrives in Los Angeles, is there another armored car there to get that bag of securities off the plane? Is, is, is... Abs- yes. Yes. And they're the ones who observe the uh, ripped open bag. When it came off the plane. So All right. So, there. so the the mystery is the mystery when is, and how. It? How did this disappear between JFK Airport and Los Angeles? And how did they get the securities off the plane? That's the big point. Little side note: my wife, who was a former flight attendant, uh, she figured it out right away. So we're back to the uh, Brooklyn Queens office. We have the three brothers and the CW, who we released him, and this guy named Warren Thomas, who just was not a relative of these people. So I said, okay, let me me try to talk to Thomas and see if I can get some, elicit his cooperation. So they're sitting down, and I'm sitting with Thomas and another agent, and he's kind of hedging here, and I don't know, and you know, I I don't want to help. And I said, well, here's here's what may happen: the other brothers, one of them may talk, and then you would end up on the short end of the stick, and you would end up in jail uh, for a long time. But if you cooperate with us, I can bring that to the attention of the United States Attorney, and that may help you. And he looked at me and he said, well, and I said, by the way, you're, you're in the position now where the train comes into the station. Either you get on the train or it passes you by and somebody else takes the uh, ride. And, and he looked at me. And at that point he said, okay, okay, I'll cooperate. And I said, okay, now you need to tell me, you cannot lie. You got to tell me the exact truth. Because if you're lying, then I cannot say that you're, cooperating with us and all, you know, any deal that comes up won't work. And he said, okay, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. And he sat with me and I'm sitting there looking at him and he's saying, well, a couple of months ago, I was in South Carolina and these three Anderson brothers were there and they came up to me and they told me they'd like me to help them uh, steal one point three million a million dollars of cash. Now, cash. I said, cash. What do you mean, cash? He said they thought that the armored car bag had cash in it. 
And I said, oh, okay, I got you now. Okay. So they convinced him he was very small. And I, and I said, well, what does that have to do with it? You know, you're a small individual, but what is that? And this is where we get the information now. He said, well, you're small enough to fit into a trunk. And, I, and I'm listening to him. I said, go ahead, tell me the rest. One of the brothers would be a passenger and check him in as baggage at JFK Airport. And I said, yes. The other brother would be in Los Angeles to pick up the brother and the trunk with Thomas in it and proceed to a hotel. And the other brother, who is the baggage handler at JFK for American, would make sure the trunk was in an unobstructed, unobstructed uh, position so that it could be he could get out of the trunk and have access to the Purolator bag. And all along, I, I mention this again, they thought it would be cash, not negotiable securities. So here we are now, and I'm listening to this story, and I go, wow, this is really interesting. So now we know how they did it, and we have the subjects in custody. And well, let, the me, other... let, me ask a, let me ask a question, yes. because you know you hear all, of, all about people who go away on a plane and the baggage or the will, and they end up dying because, you know, it was cold or the air pressure was too low or they didn't have oxygen. Did this guy know for sure that if he stowed away in a trunk in the hold of an airplane, that he wasn't going to end up dead? How, how did he know that? Okay, great question. That was uh, told to him by his bro- the one of the brothers who worked for American Airlines, the baggage handler. This particular aircraft, they knew was pressurized because it had animals, you know, in it. They put animals, pets and stuff, and they would transport them back to L.A. So they they knew the type of aircraft being used and the fact that it was pressurized. Was it cold up there? Yes, it was. But inside the trunk, he had he had some uh, clothes uh, to keep him warm, and he was unobstructed as far as get. It. There was no baggage on top of him in the, where the trunk was, and it was located next to the pure later bag. He had to trust the Anderson brothers to be telling him the truth, but he he was able to do it. And he said that when he rid, uh, sliced open the uh, the pure later armored bag with a knife that he had, he was shocked because he thought. You know, it was cash, and when he found out it was securities, he was not very happy, you know, because he knew that it, they had to be sold and such to get any cash from them. So that's exactly what happened, and uh, these individuals all were arraigned at, at, at the federal court in Brooklyn and under with the magistrate John Caden and for interstate transportation of stolen property and theft from interstate sh- shipment. And uh, they were subjected to a fifty thousand dollar bail, and they face more than twenty five years in prison and fines up to twenty thousand dollars if convicted. What the result was base- basically is that uh, Thomas, I believe, they all agreed finally to cooperate and provide uh, statements and pl- plead out. And Thomas got approximately, if I remember, eight years, and the three brothers got 15 years, and I think the cooperative uh, witness got uh, probation. So the story ends with uh, my wife was right. So she (laughs) had the answer before I even uh, had the subjects in custody. Was this just bad luck for them? Did Did the bag sometimes hold cash? Yes, and uh, it probably did, but... uh, it's I don't you know I never asked that question to Pure later, and uh, but uh, it was our benefit that they were uh, numerically marked, uh, so that we could enter them in NCIC and you know be able to catch them. Otherwise, that one break we had with that one security led us to everything. So it worked and out it, well. And if it had been cash, I guess you would to this day not know what happened. Yeah, since they passed the polygraph, the one, all the people, uh, we had no, you know, substantive in- information to go on, no leads. But one lead led us to everything, basically. The one security uh, being recovered and then following through on that. 
And this was not a terribly long case to work, but it, and it just uh, things just fell in place real well as far as I was concerned. And we were, you know, again, luck does play a role here, but also you, you know, persevere and try to get the job done the best you can and come up with uh, some good scenarios that work in this particular case. I don't want you to push it all to luck because, I mean, you did a fantastic job of investigating this to the point that you received uh, an incentive award, an award from Director Webster, uh, who was the director at the time. He commended you for your actions regarding the theft from interstate shipment case, just really gave you a great pat on the back for your ability to be able to apprehend the offenders and recover the securities in this case. So, you know, it, it wasn't just luck. I mean, you really put together the pieces in a mystery puzzle that could have gone unsolved. And for me, it was a little bit of a defining moment when everything worked out and you say, well, this is why I want to be an FBI agent. When everything just happens to work and uh, things turn out great. Yeah, not a big case, but a, you know, just it's something that you felt good about. Uh, it, it worked out. Let's put it that way. This is a situation, you know, a proud moment for you where everything worked out. But we know that that's not how life works. You know, there are situations where things don't work out, you know, that you're devastated or depressed or just in a lot of pain. And one of the things I thought about is, is the agent in Denver who was doing the dance moves and his gun falls out and, uh, you know, he ends up shooting somebody. You know, when you look at that, you, you think to yourself, oh, you know, what a knucklehead. But because we're hearing about suicide, you know, I'm starting to look at that guy. I, I understand he's going to resign uh, you know, that his, his life right now, you know, looks like it's, um, you know, pretty bad for him. Yeah. This is the type of situation in your previous work that you would be called in to, to help this person get through this trauma. Exactly. And I, I've done that where somebody was going to be fired. As soon as I knew that, I would sit down with the employee and sit and talk to them and make sure that that I'm there for them, that they know that, and that we can, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. I don't say that, but there's the rest of his life, and you can go ahead, move ahead, and, uh, you know, try to be supportive to the individual and offer them a resource so that they don't go down the, the wrong road. And uh, this is part part and parcel of what employee assistance is, what peer support is, what critical incident debriefing is. These are programs that help the employee and don't leave them hanging out there. And I had mentioned when I was reading your bio of, you know, all the work that you've done in this area, but I still think that it's kind of hard for people to understand. And again, we talked about the celebrity suicide that occurred and, you know, you're looking at these people and you're saying, you know, what great lives they appear to have. They're rich, they're famous, they're traveling. You know, everybody is admiring the things that they have, the things that they do. But it's kind of hard for us to understand why that's not enough, you know, why they take their lives. So I would love to use this opportunity for, for you to kind of help us understand I, I, that. Yeah, you know, I would be happy to. Uh, first of all, I'd like to discuss where we are today with, and statistically and then go into some uh, reasoning behind suicide and what we can do. Because right now, to the latest statistics basically from 2017 show that uh, there's 103 firefighters and 140 police officers committed suicide, which is higher than the line of duty death. What's causing this is because the first responders have been through PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression five times more, more than the civilian population. So that's part of the issue. Uh, and by the way, and, and this is my opinion and others too, this is grossly unreported, uh, some of the suicides. They just say natural causes, people hide it. It's probably 
uh, a lot more than what that is. Right now, there are 46 officers who died uh, being fatally shot in 2017, and that's nearly 67% less than the number of suicides. So as we can see, suicide is a major, major problem. It's not way widely covered by the press because, you know, the secrecy around death and uh, in police officers, and they'll, they'll cover the line of duty uh, deaths of an officer being shot, but the suicide is not uh, being mentioned by police departments, obviously because of the stigma that is still out there. And uh, what I've learned also, which I did not know, but I found out today based upon a study, less than 5% of departments, emergency services, departments, police, fire, rescue, have suicide prevention programs. I was quite shocked about that. Less than 5%? Yes, and that's, that was published uh, April 11th concerning the a study by the Ruderman Family Foundation concerning... Uh, basically uh, police and such, PTSD and such. So it's what it, what was said was uh, less than 5% have suicide prevention program, something first responders are ashamed to talk about and address, which is having de- deadly results, quote, unquote. And I agree with that. I was, you know, shocked myself because where I live in Florida, I found out that uh, there was an assistant chief who committed, of the fire department who committed suicide. And then I found, I was trying to read the article in the paper, and I saw that the fire department had no program. Well, thankfully today they do have a program. I sent them. Home. I met. First of all, I contacted the newspaper, and I said, "Who is the highest ranking person to talk to to institute a program like this?" The newspaper guy got back to me and said, "It's the commissioner." And I said. Can I have his number, the one who you think is the best person to talk to? And I got the commissioner's number, talked to them, and I said, "We need. I'd like to sit down with you and present a program for you to present to the fire department. Well, after back and forth and meeting him and such, there is a program today. So, wow, fantastic. And uh, not only that. I'm going over my daughter's house on the other side of Florida, and I meet a lieutenant fire department there. And he said he lost one of his high-ranking officials to suicide. I'm looking at him. I said, well, what, do you have a program? And he said, no, we don't have anything. I said, well, you need a program. I'm going to provide you with what was done on the other side with per- their permission, which I did. And hopefully they, they put, I'll check with them when the next time I go there if he put that into effect. So this 5%, I'm beginning to believe it now, less than 5% have programs. That's still amazing, especially when they know the numbers. I mean, obviously the the numbers, the difference between line of duty deaths and deaths by suicide, you know, is so whack, you know, that you would think that they would see the importance of having a program there for people because that's just the number of people who commit suicide. It still doesn't talk about the number of people who are going through depression and and we've got to think about how those people may react mm-hmm. during an arrest or doing you know during some type of situation. So when you talk about some of the incidents that happen where people are not happy about the police response and the police action, how many of those people are having mental or emotional problems that cause them to react? the way they react. 100%. (laughs) That's just my answer. Let's look at one thing here. Uh, And this is something we, when I was working with the FBI, it costs, well, now, then it costs $100,000 to get an agent through the uh, background check, the academy, and the first year uh, probation to get them up to snuff so that they become a good agent. We lose one agent, I'm saying now, it costs $150,000 of an eight, you know, to pay for that. So the return of the investment ROI for putting a program in existence in law enforcement, fire departments, emergency services is very important. You lose one person, you lose all that experience. You know, we talk about the stigmas. We need to step up. 
and uh, all emergency services need to step up and get programs in existence. Something where you would basically, you know, I used my 10-point program as the key because this is something I developed in the FBI. And there's 10 things that you need to do, and this will work, and it did work. One is that the chief or the head of the fire department or the head of emergency services must take the pivotal dynamic role in supporting a program. And they need to develop the program by sending a personal one-page letter to each employee, the port and police officer, meaning residents, sending it to the residents, describing suicide causes and who to contact in their employee assistance program or whatever program is set up. Number two, the employee assistance counselors or the peer supporters must be trained in first responder crisis hostage negotiation and incorporate a proactive, not reactive, proactive response on every person they receive information indicating behavior which are precursors to suicide. Number three, priority training to all shifts, squads, roll call on PTSD, depression, suicidal clues, and who to call in the manner to allow the employee assistance peer support to access the individual. Number four, target the high-stress teams. What are they? That's the undercover, child sexual exploitation, homicide, or short, informative presentations on suicide prevention. Number five, have a block of training for new recruits and their spouses on depression, post-traumatic stress, and suicide. Number six, develop a universal employee assistance program or at least a protocol, suicide response protocol approved by the legal unit of the agency on services provided after a suicide by the department, which would include general informational conference by the highest ranking official with EAP or peer support presence, one-on-one -on -one EAP counseling offered, Squad shift psychological first aid format offered. Number seven, develop a stress management program, which is part of the annual conference for all employees. And number eight, additional channels of communication to be developed between the spouses and the employee assistance program or peer support program. And number nine is what we developed in the FBI is the post-critical incident seminar. This is for all employees involved in a critical incident. It's to promote resolution and to provide follow-up support. And it's basically, it's a, it provides the members a safe location for a four-day seminar to discuss relations and uh, reactions, rather, in a safe, protective, and confidential environment. It's also open to the spouses of the employees involved in the traumatic event. And this you seminar is small. It, it's uh, 15 to 25 individuals, and they share their experiences with others. And again, the key here is confidentiality. And the participants receive peer support, which helps normalize their reaction. They also learn about trauma and coping strategies to facilitate their healing and their recovery. Additionally, peer support training permits participants to offer constructive interpersonal support in the future to fellow employees who may experience critical incidents. So they become the peer supporters to help others. So there is a, a, a payback, a helpful payback on that. And then 10, the last item that I put in there, is to develop and utilize a film, a website, or other internet electronic format to connect the police department employees regarding suicide prevention. So these are just some some of the things that I put out there. For me, I learned after this was done that uh, we we were averaging in the FBI at that time two suicides documented. That doesn't include the undocumented per year that were reported. After this program was instituted, that I just went through those ten pro ten issue ten points there that we basically uh, did not have suicides for uh, three years. That's what I learned after I retired. So there is a 
way to do it. And again, everything I did here was proactive. And number two, and everything that's done is done in a confidential atmosphere. There is, uh, there are, that's why you need a written program down. Anybody who wants that, I'd be happy to give that to them. Uh, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to ask you that because there are a number of law enforcement officers and heads of law enforcement agencies that I know are regular listeners to FBI Retired Case File Review. So should they reach out to you through LinkedIn? Uh, yes, that's fine. My email is, you know, vincent.j.mcnally at gmail.com or through LinkedIn, which will give you some of the articles that I've talked about or that I've alluded to. Uh, it's important that they reach out and get a program going. The best thing we, like what I'm doing now, is set up a, a teleconference uh, with the uh, team, the players, the leaders of the leaders of the organization, because I say that they have to be the leaders. If they aren't the people making the decision, and they, then I'm, it's the program is doomed to failure. Uh, it has to be the leaders of the program, the chief, the fire department chief or the commissioners. And at that point, he has to be an active participant in that he has to show up at conferences and support the program. Because if the other people get a whiff of the fact that this is just some other program, it's doomed to failure. It has to be supported by the highest level. It works if you do that. So uh, let, let me ask you a question, or let me, let me make a comment first. And I had mentioned this to you before we started recording, that I, for the first time, really got an aha moment when it came to suicide because I was reading just last night a blog post by author uh, Lauren Davis, and she was explaining what suicide was like because you're thinking, you just can't understand how bad it could be that they would commit suicide. And she gave an example that just opened my eyes. She was talking about 9-11, how you have these people in this tower that is burning and they jump out the window because they know they're going to die. They feel they're going to die and they made this choice. Do I die by being burned to death in the tower or do I jump out the window? And the jumping out the window is their way of taking action to make the pain go away. How do you feel about that explanation? It's a very good explanation because my understanding and having dealt with actively active suicidal individuals is that they are stuck in that moment where they figure that the only relief they can get and I'm in the moment is to kill themselves. To stop that un what they feel is an unbearable pain. And how does counseling, how how does that help in those moments? Okay, you have to, yeah, it's uh, difficult, but we're trying to prevent that, that one moment where the person becomes actively suicidal to, to happen. And that's through the counseling, through the understa and understanding of depression or post-traumatic stress and what it does to you. The more understanding you have of that and the more support you have from the counselors or peer support, that may be enough to stop it. And I've had cases where I intervene and stop it right then. When I get a call and says, somebody says, the person was in the office, I came back from vacation, and the person says, uh, the supervisor says, the uh, person hasn't shown up for work for three days. And I said, what? I immediately jumped in, called the person. I said, I'll be right over. I didn't give the person a chance. I went right over. And the person admitted that they had thoughts of driving a vehicle into the, into a tunnel and hitting the wall. And I'm listening and I'm going, okay, what we need to do is help you here and convince the person to get, basically to commit themselves and get the treatment they need. I use one analogy. When I was a young man, I was a lifeguard on a beach. Fun job, great job. But you jump, you know, you see somebody drowning, you go get them. You don't wait to think, well, 
Maybe they're not. Maybe they are. Well, this is where we are now. We need to make that jump into the water and save that person. We don't do that. We may lose that person. We have to be proactive and get out there and pay attention to what's going on and help people. Listening, active listening, listening to people. Talk about suicide like you would any other health condition. And really understand that talking about suicide does not cause a person to commit suicide. That's one of the basic premises in hostage negotiation and when we talk about suicide intervention. Know that when you bring up that subject, it is not going to cause somebody to commit suicide. And also realize that anyone around you can be suicidal. So you have to be open to the understanding that it could happen at any time. And listen when somebody is, you know, you're talking to during a discussion. And ask direct questions. Please don't say, hey, you're not feeling well today, are you? No, no, you just say, what's going on? Open-ended question. What, what are you doing? You don't look good. What's going on? And check your bias at the door. We're at the point where we're listening to the individual, asking them, are you suicidal? Are you trying to kill yourself? We need to ask those direct questions. And I remember other another uh, EAP person calling me from another office at headquarters and saying, this person uh, went out and uh, stated that they were going to go home and drink themselves to death. And I said, okay, and what have we done about that? Well, I, I can't do anything because I need a search warrant. I said, you don't need a search warrant. You go out to that house, knock on the door, and talk to that person right now. He said, well, what authority do I have? And I said, you don't need authority, but you have mine if you need it. Just go do it. So we're at the juncture now in society where we need to step up and get out there and, and pay attention, listen, and try to do the right thing. And the right thing means it may be uncomfortable to you, and you will feel uncomfortable, and that's okay. But get, don't downplay the issue. Speak up. Go out. Ask direct questions. Listen to the individual and help them. And realize that any self-harm can happen to someone you know. I'm really into trying to get this message out to folks that we need to change our direction and be proactive. Well, I hope the listeners don't mind that I took the time to talk about this issue. I know that normally this is a podcast that deals with case reviews, but again, since so many of my audience you know, are law enforcement people or people who care about others in law enforcement, I wanted to make sure that we touched on this topic today. I was lucky that we had already scheduled this case review and that we were able to get you on at this time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to bring this up again because it's a timely subject which needs to be addressed. And we'd be <laughs> remiss if we didn't do it because it's silly to think that the uh, Death, you know, the police and firemen who especially witness all this death and destruction every day. It's silly to think it wouldn't put a toll on them. PTSD, trauma, it does. No matter what they say or anybody says, it certainly does. And uh, what we can do is educate and train. And from that, we prevent suicide. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Vince McNally. You'll find his 10-point program for suicide reduction and articles about the cargo theft case. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for this week. I am reading a great novel that I'll tell you more about next week. But in the meantime, I hope you check out my crime novels, Greedy Givers and Pay to Play, both inspired by true crime FBI Philadelphia cases. 
It's not too late for greedy givers to hit number one under financial thrillers at Amazon.com. But I need your help to do that. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.